Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Today we will pr be presenting on effective leadership for the implementation of evidence-based school-wide literacy instruction. I will be one of your presenters today. My name is Lauren Rosenbauer and I assist with the dissemination work as well as the technical assistance work on the Lead for Literacy Center and am a research assistant at the American Institutes for Research. We also have Dr. Lauren Artsy presenting today. She is a technical assistance coach for the Lead for Literacy Center and senior researcher at American Institutes for Research. She brings 16 years of experience in education, five as an ESL teacher and 11 years in education research and as a technical assistance provider. The Lead for Literacy Center is a partnership among literacy experts, researchers, and technical assistance providers at the University of Oregon's Center on Teaching and Learning and the American Institutes for Research. In this presentation, you will learn about Lead for Literacy Center's approach to supporting school leaders' use of evidence-based literacy practices within the context of multi-tiered systems of support including tools and resources to support teachers' use of high quality reading instruction. Specifically, the Lead for Literacy leadership framework will be discussed and presenters will demonstrate how the components from the framework can be used by school leaders to evaluate readiness for MTSS implementation and develop comprehensive action plans to support a robust school-wide MTSS system. Overall, this session will showcase resources that can be accessed for immediate application in school settings. We don't endorse resources, but we definitely seek to disseminate. So there is a resource list handout we put together today that contains a link and brief description of every resource that will be mentioned during our presentation. It includes videos for professional learning, as well as some resources to support lesson planning and teamwork around literacy. There are also a few resources related to literacy instruction considerations in remote or hybrid educational settings. Now let's dive into what the Lead for Literacy Center or L4L's focus is. Building capacity for leaders to recognize evidence-based literacy practices and to facilitate their implementation through identifying and supporting instruction and intervention programming and professional development, including coaching. You've heard me use this term before, and I use it very intentionally and specifically, and that is evidence-based. Evidence-based means we know from high quality research of great integrity that these literacy practices we'll discuss today work for children and that the leadership practices we'll discuss today work for leaders. So in that context, we're talking about building capacity so leaders will recognize evidence-based practices and help facilitate their implementation. Now, before we get into any further into our presentation, I'd like to discuss the why behind our work. There is more and more strong evidence being released that having an effective school leader significantly impacts student achievement and outcomes. As you can see from this graphic here, when a below average principal is replaced with an above average principal, the average student gains an additional three months of learning in reading and mathematics. I cannot understate the importance of school leaders' uh, role in our um, improvement of literacy outcomes for students. All right, so let's begin. The key question our presentation will address today is listed on this slide. What do school leaders need to know and do to be effective literacy leaders? In terms of what leaders need to know, Firstly, they need to have knowledge around what it takes to be a successful reader. So they do need to get into the content with a leadership perspective of what does high quality evidence-based reading instruction look like in the classroom? And then relatedly, what do you look for in the classroom as a leader? What do you see in terms of instruction? What do you hear in terms of what is happening in the classroom? Leaders also need to know how to support teachers in the implementation of evidence-based practices, and they need to have a sense of how to evaluate, improve, and monitor their system. In order for children to be strong readers, we know that they need to have two crucial skills. The first being word recognition, uh, which refers to phonological awareness, decoding, phonics, 
alphabetics, and other skills that allow readers to recognize and map sounds of letters to words for effective and efficient word recognition. The second skill readers need for effective reading comprehension is language comprehension, which refers to skills that allow a reader to use language to understand what they are reading, such as oral language proficiency, background knowledge, vocabulary, and understanding grammar and discourse structures. That is shown in this diagram here, which is called the simple view of reading. The simple view formula makes clear that reading comprehension is the product of word recognition and language comprehension. The formula is set up as a multiplication problem to show that we are unable to achieve the final goal of reading comprehension without one of the key components. Students need mastery of both word recognition and language comprehension in order to successfully comprehend what they are reading. Intervention for struggling readers is effective only when it addresses students' specific weaknesses, which may be decoding, language comprehension, or even both. So you've probably heard about the five components of reading specified by the National Reading Panel that align with the simple view of reading. Let's look at them more closely. So as you can see, phonemic awareness and alphabetic principles, or the red and yellow components, are those skills that help support word recognition. Vocabulary and reading comprehension, so the blue and purple uh, components here, are those text level skills that help support a reader's comprehension of text. Fluency, which is indicated by the green component, is defined as students' ability to name or read letters, sounds, words, sentences, and passages accurately and at an appropriate pace. We situate these key features of literacy instruction within a multi-tiered system of support. MTSS is a framework for learning and instruction. You can embed the evidence-based practices for language and literacy throughout this MTSS system where there is high quality core instruction that is aligned with research and standards. For children who may be struggling, there is strong assessment practices around screening so that we may understand which children could benefit from additional interventions to support their learning opportunities around the areas they may be struggling in. Again, assessment is used to understand students' response to intervention at that tier two level. For children whose data suggests that they would benefit from additional support, there are some intervention intensification strategies that can be used. So you may be wondering, what is my role in MTSS as a school leader? Your role is really critical because school leaders guide their school in the implementation of a school-wide reading model in MTSS. So I'll now turn it over to our other Lauren, <laughs> who will walk us through the Lead for Literacy framework. Great, thank you so much um, for that background and for laying the foundation on the importance of um, those code-based and meaning level skills to support um, students' recognition of words on a page of text as well as their reading comprehension. As Lauren mentioned at the beginning of the session, the leader of the, of the school has a really critical role in supporting the implementation of their school MTSSR um, framework. And so the Lead for Literacy Center has um, developed a framework that um, comes from what the research is showing as important areas for school leadership to engage their school staff on. And we've developed this framework that um, is organized under five elements and so you see that there is um, one element is standards, priorities, and goals. Another one is administration, organization, and communication. There's assessments and um, the use of data and database decision-making structures on a school team. Um, instruction intervention, including, as Lauren was showing through the MTSS framework, considerations for core instruction, as well as intervention and intensification, and then professional development and job embedded collaborative learning. Each of these elements has about four to six kind of sub areas that we call topics. So we kind of think of this as five elements and 28 topics that make up the framework. Um, the next slide 
shows this framework just kind of visualized in a different way. So we have the five elements again, and they're all situated within this circle, this yellow circle, which is the professional learning systems and professional development, because we know that professional development is really important for to build educator capacity and implementation around these elements within this framework. You also see these arrows connecting assessments and instruction intervention, because we know that um, the data and assessments have a really critical role in informing how instruction is supporting students and meeting their needs, and also informs um, what additional supports children may need. Um, so the next slide shows what we call this continuous improvement process for implementation. In a minute, we'll show some tools to support school leaders in the implementation of the framework I just showed. But we use this continuous improvement process where leaders can work with their school teams to evaluate what's currently in place at the school, the level of implementation of each of the elements, prioritize an action plan, per develop some goals and implement those, and then kind of go back through the cycle again. And um, we're gonna show you a couple of web pages. On the next slide is the Lead for Literacy Center. And then I will actually show it on my computer screen. So this is the website to the Lead for Literacy Center where you'll find a lot of information about the framework that I just showed here. And I'll actually show it to you in a minute. There's a number of literacy leadership briefs for school leaders and also briefs that show other resources that we'll also look at um, in this session. And there's also videos and webinars and a resource repository. So you can actually search um, in the resource repository by framework element and then what um, uh, kind of resource you're looking for. And um, this is the resource repository link that I just showed. And then on the next slide, you'll see a tool to help support school leaders in their implementation of the framework, which we call the navigator, the framework navigator. So in a minute, I will show it to you on the website, but you'll see here that uh, there's the element. So the example on this page is the professional development and job embedded collaborative learning element. And then again, each element has about four to six topics um, for a total of 28 topics. And so those are um, shown in light blue in the framework navigator. So now I'm going to um, share my screen. We're going to show a couple of resources and, and websites through this session. As Lauren was saying, we want to disseminate what is out there. We don't necessarily endorse any specific resource, but we do want to show some open access universal resources that are um, that have been developed, a lot of them through um, the Technical Assistance and Dissemination Network and also the um, What Works Clearinghouse. So this first one is the Lead for Literacy website. And again, this is where you can find um, the Lead for Literacy framework information. It's organized under the framework elements. So if I click on, for instance, standards, priorities, and goals, it will take you to um, all of the topics for standards, priorities, and goals, and you can click on it and you get more information and other resources. If I go back to the framework page, the framework navigator is on the right-hand side, so I'll click on that. And what it is, is it's an informal um, tool that school leaders can use to understand in their schools and buildings what in the framework is implemented and where some action priorities might, might be. So you have it in PDF form over on the right-hand side. And if you prefer to um, kind of work with the navigator as a Google sheet, it's also in that form as well. This is the resource repository that where we showed the link before and you can search by framework element as well as resource type. And then we also have a bunch of literacy leadership briefs. And I just want to mention um, these briefs down here because these are briefs that connect what works clearinghouse practice guides um, together. So we'll, we'll talk about the practice guides later on in the session. And if you're looking for a way to get to the practice guides, these briefs provide the links to those practice guides. Back over, great. And so as you're working with the resources and the navigator and your school team, um, as I said before, the team, you might connect with the team about what is your current strength, where are there areas um, that you want to kind of more strongly implement or stretch? 
what might be a goal in this next year and what might be a step um, to move some of the work forward. And that might help inform um, an action plan from the school team. So now that we've kind of talked about overall the Lead for Literacy website and um, some of the tools that can help um, schools understand what um, in the framework is implemented and where you know some action goals and priorities may be, we wanted to dive in and just briefly overview the framework elements. So the first element is standards, priorities, and goals. And as I showed um, on the website, you can see kind of the topic buttons um, in the squares below. So we have prioritizing standards, um, developing student goals, action planning, and communicating guiding principles. So again, going to the website that I showed the navigator place on the website, um, each area you can click on to find what are indicators of success um, related to each of these different topics. What are some additional resources that can help your school team in planning and prioritizing and action planning around these topics? Um, one thing I did want to highlight is the importance of um, providing and, and engaging with the, the school team around um, vision setting for the work. And so this is just an example of one of the areas that you can dive more into, but um, really working when the, you know, everything begins with the framework um, and understanding what is the mission and the vision for the work. So um, what are you trying to implement and why? Even what is a near-term goal? What is a more, um, you know, further long-term goal? How will you create a culture of expectations that support the work for, um, developing a vision. And there is some um, resources that can help support teams in developing their vision and their mission. And um, that is on the resource list. And it's in a link below um, as well in a resource called Leading by Convening. This next slide shows another um, element under administration, organization, and communication. And again, there's a number of different topics such as um, a leadership presence, family and community engagement, high quality staff and resources. And again, I definitely encourage everyone if possible to go to the website and kind of click on each of these topic buttons to just find out more specifics related to each one of these elements. But I did wanna highlight in this, um, the importance of leadership roles and having a teaming approach. And so, um, when we talk about the Lead for Literacy framework, um, it's important that teaming is an important structure with the school team. So we definitely developed the framework with a distributed teaming um, approach in mind. So that just really helps to generate buy-in, improve the likelihood of sustainability, and helps to address turnover. And specifically what we mean is when we talk about the importance of teams is, um, you know, having a team, an MTSSR team, um, where, if you go to the, the next slide, yeah. So um, having an MTSSR team that's focused on school-wide systems level. And um, this team is a good team to engage when looking at, for instance, the Lead for Literacy framework, and maybe even do, working with the team and some of the tools and resources like the navigator. And then you would also have grade level professional learning communities that where their focus is really around the grade and classroom level. Um, and that's shown in the blue circle. And both teams are really engaged with this database decision-making, you know, really looking at the data, really understanding what the data looks like um, in terms of the level of implementation and instruction, student outcomes, and also how school staff is engaging with professional learning opportunities as well. Um, great. And the next element that we wanted to talk about is instruction and intervention. And so with this one, we think about instructional time, quality adjustments, and then those areas that Lauren showed us earlier related to MTSS. So core instruction as well as intervention and intensification. Um, in a minute, I'll show you some resources to support um, 
school teams around evidence-based practices related to instruction and intervention. But I did just want to um, talk again about the simple view of reading. So again, Lauren highlighted the importance of um, having instructional practices that support students in their skills related to word recognition or decoding, and also understanding what they're reading in terms of language comprehension. And those skills together help support children's reading comprehension. Um, so more specifically, when you think about decoding, we talk about um, the importance of developing skills around print concepts, phonological awareness, word recognition, um, sight vocabulary, and fluency. And then on the other hand, with language comprehension, we talk about skills around inferential language, literal comprehension skills, narrative language skills, academic vocabulary, and background knowledge. Um, and that really helps because children, in order to really understand the text and comprehend it, need to be able to recognize the words on a page of text, but they also need to understand what that page means. So what the vocabulary means, what that, um, what the grammatical structures are, and what that, you know, that comprehension piece as well. And so I wanted to, um, in a minute, show you some of the resources that can help, um, support school teams um, around core instruction and they provide different recommendations for core instruction. And so the next thing I will show you is some resources from the What Works Clearinghouse. And so we'll, we'll look at some practice guides. And again, I'll show you the link to get to them through the What Works Clearinghouse. And you can also access them um, from the Lead for Literacy site under the Briefs for Le Literacy Leaders. And then we'll also show some additional resources for professional learning teams, some videos that illustrate the recommendations. And this is the What Works Clearinghouse. It's um, ies.ed.gov slash NCEE slash WWC. And we have this on the resources list that Lauren showed at the beginning of the session. And um, if you go to the links at the bottom, I'm going to click on practice guides just to show where they are. And a practice guide is a publication that presents recommendations for educators. They're based on reviews of research and there are panels that um, were convened um, to basically review the research and develop some, a couple of key recommendations from the research. So they're on a variety of topics. You know, there's math ones, there's uh, ones related to reading and writing. Um, and so I'll just show you an example of one. This one is um, foundational skills to support understanding and reading uh, kindergarten through grade three. They have about four recommendations. So there's four recommendations in this one. Some of them have, um, you know, a few more. So it, it does vary by practice guide. And um, the other thing that they have is a lot of them have different um, you know, additional information. So some of them have lesson examples. Some of them have some discussions about some roadblocks that might be encountered with each recommendation and strategies for overcoming the roadblocks. This one has some guides around supporting reading at home. Um, and so I'm going to click on to some additional resources that um, were developed to go along with the practice guide. So you see here in this section, there is this resource that's related to this current situation that um, we've all been um, working with this year. And this is how to understand the recommendations in the practice guide in a remote learning context. And so there's this infographic. And then there is um, this resource here under supporting your child's reading at home. And it's a whole other website with recommendations. There's a bunch of videos too that illustrate different home activities parents and caregivers can engage with um, to support reading comprehension skills and, and reading skills at home. There is also um, some resources related to pro supporting professional learning communities. So for instance, communities might use this guide and there's a bunch of videos in this link that illustrate all of the different recommendations and practices. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so um, in addition to summarizing uh, the importance of the essential reading components, which I did earlier, 
The National Reading Panel also reiterated the importance of explicit, systematic, and strategy instruction, particularly in the development of foundational reading skills such as phonemic awareness and phonics. Um, so word recognition skills can be improved when a teacher uses explicit, systematic, and strategy instruction across all levels of instruction. To support language comprehension, researchers, researchers suggest combining all three types of instruction. So explicit instruction involves direct instruction on a skill. Instruction begins with simple skills and moves to more complex ones. For example, explicit phonics instruction may begin with initial consonants and as an effective strategy for working progress to short vowel and consonant combinations. If you're looking for examples of what instruction uh, looks like, explicit instruction looks like, you should definitely reference the WWC videos on your resource handout that Lauren just walked us through. Systematic instruction involves sequencing lessons to build upon previously taught skills in a logical sequence. Uh, additionally, systematic instruction includes clear student objectives as well as a plan for assessment. It can be delivered to one child or to a small group of students at the same time. In strategy instruction, teachers may provide opportunities for guided practice that includes teacher support of a previously taught skill, as well as independent practice in which students work individually or in small groups to develop mastery with previously learned content. Practice opportunities for learned skills are embedded across the curriculum to increase maintenance and generalization of newly mastered skills, such as peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, visual and verbal supports, uh, and academic language structures. This is really helpful for supporting reading comprehension strategies and word learning strategies, such as prefix, affix, or context clues. Again, if you'd like to see examples of this strategy instruction in use, the WWC videos are a great resource. If you're looking for additional resources, there are the 10 key documents by the Meadows Center that were written for a practitioner audience um, on a variety of topics, including vocabulary and reading comprehension. The National Center on Improving Literacy also has a lot of resources, including literacy briefs or infographics and implementation toolkits. Uh, so you can reference your resource handout for direct links and a short summary of each resource that is mentioned here. Next, we have some resources that provide student materials for teachers that, that can be used um, during lessons. There are several activities for elementary school on the Florida Center for Reading Research web website um, on all areas uh, that we've been talking about, including phonemic awareness, alphabetic principles, vocabulary, fluency, and reading comprehension. And then Project Elite is a model demonstration project funded by OSEP or the Office um, of Special Education. And they have great uh, example curriculum on reading support reading aloud routines, and more. The majority of schools have been doing some form of distance learning this year, whether that be hybrid or fully online. Uh, so if you're looking for resources to help support literacy instruction in a remote or hybrid environment, Student Achievement Partners and the University of Florida Literacy Institute offer a variety of resources. Um, University of Florida has an entire virtual teaching resource hub that is broken down into different topics. Um, and Student Achievement Partners recently released a helpful guidance document that details what literacy and English language instructional content should be prioritized as we uh, attempt to accelerate learning over the 2021-2022 school year. Now we'll talk about specific considerations for intervention and intensive intervention. So this here is an example of how intensity increases across the tiers of support. So as we move uh, from the bottom of the triangle in tier one up to the top of the triangle in tier three, what is intensifying and how are we doing that? We are getting more explicit and systematic as we move across the tiers of support. And we can do that by decreasing group size, providing more opportunity for student response, 
by teaching and reteaching and offering more opportunities for, for um, practice and feedback. In this diagram, student one and student two are the focus. In tier one, those two students are two out of 26 students. As they move to tier two, they are two out of five students. So more opportunity uh, to practice and respond. And then as they move into tier three, student one and student two are the only participants in that group. So we will really be looking at how we can hone in on skills and as research suggests, focus on up to three essential skills for the components of reading. It's important you're choosing an intervention that matches your students' needs and is evidence-based. The National Center on Intensive Intervention is an excellent resource to help inform you on that decision. In their tools chart, you can filter for literacy as well as by grade level, and that is on your resource handout. This slide looks at tier two and three curriculum and evidence-based practices. This is a resource for you to look back on um, after you finish the presentation and think about what your curriculum and evidence-based practices look like in tiers two and three. Okay, so there are four areas to think about for intervention and intensive intervention. Before we begin though, it's important to note that prior to adjusting instruction, we need to ensure that any curriculum we're using for students is being implemented. So step one is use data. Data should be used before intensifying instruction to determine whether intensification is needed. Number two, consider areas to intensify. So data determines when to systematically and purposefully intensify instruction. Number three, develop a plan. What is our plan and what actionable steps can we take? And the fourth and final step, collect student data and implementation data um, once the plan has been implemented so that we can monitor whether the student is having success or whether we need to change our strategy. I wanna emphasize the connection between data and our instructional decisions. One should not be happening without the other. Okay. The National Center on Intensive Intervention has a database individualization cycle that can assist you in tailoring instruction to meet students' individualized needs. So that is a great resource to reference as you're looking at tying data and instruction together. Considering areas to intensify is number two. Uh, we've gathered our data, analyzed it, now how can we intensify it? Again, NCII has a great resource for this as well. And some questions to consider as you're making decisions about intensifying instruction, instruction for students. Uh, so for example, you can see here group size, the way instruction is delivered. Um, there are multiple different areas to consider. The last part is planning and implementing. NCII has great implementation resources to help with intensification as well. Uh, these resources can help you consider if your school-based teams and leadership um, our intensifying instruction for students, how can we plan and implement that instruction to best support students in their learning? Lastly, we have a few additional resources um, to assist you with intervention and intensive intervention. This Meadows uh, 10 key document for uh, key practices for reading and for intervention, and NCII has an entire web page dedicated uh, to activities and videos that help support intensifying intervention for literacy specifically. And now I'll turn it back over to Lauren so that she can walk us through the final two elements of the L4L framework. Great, thank you. Um, so we have just a bit of time left, so I'll go a little bit quickly over these, but again, definitely encourage everybody to go to the website because all the information that um, I'm talking through is on under each of the different elements. So for assessment, we think about um, the types of assessments, the um, and the different way that data can inform how instruction is meeting students' um, learning needs. And so while we want the most rigorous and relevant assessment system, um, as possible, we also want to balance that with efficiency because we know that um, each time a child spends an assessment is time also spent away from instruction. The different types of assessments that we often see in um, 
different um, school systems is assessments around, for instance, universal screening, which will take place in core instruction. And that helps us understand, you know, are students being met through core instruction, their needs being met, or are there students that would um, benefit from some additional support? There's progress monitoring. So if children are in or students in intervention, we would want to monitor their progress to understand how intervention is meeting their needs. And then diagnostic assessments help us understand more specific about students' different skills and um, what skills they may need additional support on. And then lesson mastery kind of asks the question, is the student learning and instructional content um, mastering the content that is um, being taught in the lesson? And the next slide, um, there are some key questions for um, assessment teams. So again, you wanna utilize your teaming structures um, in the grade level and across the grade levels to really look at the assessment um, information that you're getting as well as other data to understand how instruction is meeting students' learning needs. So for instance, um, you wanna understand like how, you know, is, is the school-wide um, reading system working for the students? How is instruction? working for the students. And again, we know that um, there is this virtual situation that um, many school systems are uh, you know, working with this year. And so there's a number of different resources that we've included on the resource page around assessing in a virtual context. So um, again, we want to um, point you to some of the resource pages as well. When we look at professional development, we want to consider um, high quality professional learning workshop opportunities that help support educator capacity and different evidence-based practices, as well as the more job embedded coaching structures um, related to professional learning. So you can see those three components on the next slide where we think about workshops and institutes and how that integrates with coaching and um, professional learning community um, work as well. Um, this is a, um, again, like one tool that's out there, there's, there's others as well around collecting um, information about how the workshops and the coaching are supporting uh, teachers in the school. And so this is called the HQPD. And again, there's a link for this on your resources list. And um, we just wanted to highlight that in, this is one um, research report related to the role of um, collecting some implementation data. So for instance, uh, a school leader might do some walkthroughs of their classes to understand um, you know, what instruction looks like across the different classrooms within and across grades. And um, data can really help school teams set school-wide priorities and engage with professional development that address their specific areas of needs. And again, some questions for school teams that's important with walkthroughs is, are you collecting data that um, helps shed light on um, instruction and within and across grades? What kinds of support and professional learning opportunities would the um, school benefit from? And is reading instruction anchored in high quality evidence-based practices? I did want to show briefly um, a tool um, that is a walkthrough tool from um, the RHEL uh, South, Southeast. And um, it is a walkthrough tool for school leaders for grades K through three. Um, and it includes kind of a pre walkthrough meeting guide. And then it has um, a post walkthrough uh, routine, reflection and planning, and a place for action planning. And it includes specific um, practices and key considerations at grade levels, kindergarten through third grade. And they have a separate set of tools for um, the upper grades as well. Um, and so that was a lot to a lot of information, um, but we did just kind of want to wrap it up again with the lead for literacy framework and the continuous improvement process. So you sort of see both on this slide where it's important with school teams when you're looking at the lead for literacy framework and those five elements that we spent this session kind of talking through, you want to you know, implement those through a continuous improvement process where teams evaluate, prioritize, action plan, implement, you kind of continue in that circle. So I'll turn it over to Lauren. Yes, so to wrap up, just a reminder that this tool um, by the Lead for Literacy Center has um, been developed to support the implementation of a school-wide MTSS and is a really great resource. 
Um, if you'd like to stay in the know about Lead for Literacy's new resource releases, there are a few different options. You can follow us on our newsletter, which is at the bottom of our website, or on Twitter or Facebook. So to close up, if you have any questions about this presentation or how L4L can help support your school or district's work, please be sure to reach out. And thank you so much for joining us today uh, to watch our presentation.